Can't really. Can you look over your shoulder? This is not a PowerPoint. This is actually a, a workshop, so you can even get closer still uh, if you like. Um, so you can see under the light. This is a this is a bore figure I did, and you can kind of he, he's got he got I've got a little bit more work to do on him. I've got to finish the rifle. You can see. Um, I've just got the rifle kind of stuck in his hands. You can kind of see how the rifle has been modified. Uh, I've sanded off all of the the, uh, the bands on it, which uh, were were there on the Springfield originally, and I've cut the stock down, the end of the stock down a little ways to make it more in keeping with the length of the Mauser rifle that this is going to be. Tried to sand it smooth as best I could, and then I've carved off the mechanism at the top. Uh, with the ID and of course all the firing mechanism off the side of the Springfield, so now this will turn into a clip, uh, clip-fed uh, Mauser. But you can see I I built up the bottom of this with some A and B and Duro combination just to make it a little. You can see there's some green on the bottom. That's just to beef it up and to give it a little of the reinforcement that the Mauser had. So basically, all I really have to do on this is create the firing mechanism and the lever, the trigger guard, uh, the clips for the the, the hooks for the uh, for the sling, and then I've got uh, uh, a sight that I have to put here, and then a sight at the end of the rifle. And uh, I think there's two bands. I think there's a band that'll go across right about here, and then another band right here at the end, right over this uh, over this joint. And then there'll be a little uh, ramrod in there as well. We we're talking about the internet earlier. Great resource, printed right off the internet. Um, this is the 1898 uh, Mauser. Got the, got the dimensions as well, uh, compared it to my Springfield so I knew how much I needed to cut down. So you can see there's really some great, great detail photographs here of what I'm going to have to add to the top of this. So you can see I've just carved this area, kind of flattened it out to create this. I've got to have a little stud, stud there as well. Um, so yeah, a little bit of work. One of the challenges with this kind of thing is trying to figure out a way to create this little indentation here. Uh, frankly, with a metal piece of metal this small, I just don't have the tools to do that. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to create that with paint. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Either that or I'll strategically have it hand over it so it won't, uh, won't be showing. But but yeah, good stuff. A Com couple other photographs. And you know, it's great to be able to pull up photographs like this and, and just print them out. And I just cut and pasted them into a Word document. And so I had a nice little combination of, you know, reference pictures. So if you'd like to pass that around and have a look at it. What I'm going to do today, I'm, I, I've got a commission that I'm going to start on, well, starting on today, I guess, to do a, uh, an Officer of the Zouaves. Actually, it's a commission by Robin Smith, who's the author of this book. Um, I did a Zouave for him last year, and Robin lives in England, and he wants me to do a figure of, uh, oh, I can't remember the guy's name. It's this guy right here, okay. this Zouave officer. I'm not sure exactly whether I'm going to have him... He won't be in that pose, but um, whether I want to have him just wearing that gaudy uniform or whether I want to do something else with him. But um, he was an officer that uh, joined uh, the Durier Zouaves early on, and then later he went over to the 140th New York. But he wants me to do him in this uniform, and I'm really kind of thinking it'd be a lot more interesting to me, actually, to... Uh, there's a couple of photographs in here that are kind of interesting. A lot of photographs of Zouaves. I like the idea of, uh, there's a picture of Robin wearing his, his Zouave outfit. He goes to the, he goes to the grocery yeah. store wearing that uh, in England. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he probably does, I, I don't know. But there's some kind of cool pictures in here of Zouave officers um, with gray coats or cloaks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I doubt whether he'll want to have all of that gaudy uniform stuff uh, concealed, but I'm thinking in terms of having that cloak draped over his shoulder or something, just to give him a little more, um, you know, just, just to make him look a little more interesting. And I think having a darker background for all that color I think would be kind of good. I think he looks a little bit like a guy uh, out of a Disneyland parade the way he is right now. So. Um, but anyway, the idea right now is to do this, and because I'm doing an officer and I'm trying to show off the, the elegance of his attire, um, he's not going to be in an action pose, he's not going to be in combat. This guy will probably be in some kind of parade ground setting, but I, the challenge with the parade ground setting is how do you come up with a pose that's got to be interesting, you know, and also how, what face to choose. 
So I I brought my whole part box along. This is basically my little uh, my little goodie box where I select parts from. I've got a bunch of bunch of armature parts here. I've got one with feet. I've got uh, various uh, little minor equipment parts. I've got some more parts and some other bins for that. And then I've got a bunch of different um, heads and arms and basically a lot of heads in these three compartments here. At one point, I had them separated in my into my my A bin, my B bin, and my C bin. The C bin basically was heads that I would never use unless I had to do some really bizarrely bizarre figure with a really strange facial expression. But over the years, they've be, gotten all kind of garbled, so I have to reorganize them, I think. But uh, I don't know, I thought you might want to, you might get a kick out of, so that's, that's, I have that, I have that in one of my drawers, that's the first thing I pull out when I start working on a figure, so, yeah. I have just a quick question. Sure. Back in the old modeling magazines, you did the, the MP on a motorcycle and the two Germans in a sidecar, what scale were they? I never did a German in the sidecar. never did it, so. I did a British MP a stock figure a long time ago, holding his hand out like that in khaki. Okay. But I've never done a German uh, sidecar yeah. thing. That must be a different bill. No, well, what about <laughs> what about the? There was one with the American MP with the motorcycle. No, no. Just got to tell you. Wrong so, guy. I know, right? <laughs> um, Guys, quick question. Bill. Sure. And you'll probably get to it later. Uh, the ratio that you use for the body. Well, it, the, I mean, it's really just what David described earlier, which is <clears throat> when I use A and B putty, um, the, the different putties I'm, I, I use, I've always done it this way, and David gave a very good uh, description of just another one of the seemingly endless yeah, number nice. of interesting putties that keep coming out, and sculptors will change from this putty to that putty, or that putty to this putty, and there's a lot of putties out there. I mean, right now there's... There's so many good putties that you can work with, there's almost no wrong answer. I mean, it's really what you like. And uh, I, I, I believe that most sculptors need to have a putty that's really hard, that they can use for really firm foundations. Uh, I've always used A and B for that. A and B is one of the oldest putties in modeling. It's been around for a long time. It's very, very reliable for creating a good, a good solid, well, a, a nice sturdy foundation to sculpt on and then you basically need another putty that you can really do fine detail fine smooth detail with but your green on, on the on this board mm -hmm. it's not just the uh didn't, don't you mix a little of the a and b yeah. with that that's yeah. what i'm getting at. yeah you're way way ahead okay I'll, but uh, but uh, but i'll but i'll answer your question um the uh these two putties can be used by themselves or they can be used mixed together and why would you mix them together? I mean, what's, what's the point of that? And the reason for that is this putty, um, its strengths when you mix the yellow and the blue together is it has a, a slightly pliable, wa almost wax-like consistency, which, which holds extremely fine detail. Just like the gray putty David was describing. He came over and showed me a few pieces of it. Feels very much like this when it's dry. Um, very, very good for that kind of thing. When you want to do um, a sleeve or a, a flowing coat or a baggy pair of trousers or something else, this putty can be used for that, but it doesn't lend itself very well to being brushed out. You can brush it, you can brush over it to smooth it, but it's basically very wax-like to begin with. You, you put your finger in your mouth and rub a little saliva over it, and it's even without doing that, it's pretty damn smooth. Uh, it doesn't really need to be brushed, but every once in a while, you don't use a brush just to smooth things, but to actually create a flow of, of a drapery in a garment. And uh, when you're talking about sleeves and things like that, that's, that's not as, you can do those with sculpting tools. But when you're talking about a more of a flowing kind of garment, you have to have a way of doing that. And brushes are a really good way of basically getting those basic contours. And then you can go back with other sculpting tools to play around with it. The good thing about mixing the two, trying to use a Duro by, its, by itself, I call it Duro, it's Nita tight now. Using Duro by itself is that Duro tends to be a little stiffer and a little firmer and crisper, which is a really good thing when doing detail, but not so good when you're doing long flowing things. So on the other hand, using straight A and B is not so good because A and B tends to be a wider grained putty. It tends to be a little more porous looking. It can be smoothed out, but you have to be patient. You have to brush it out. 
it'll tend to be a little gummy and kind of stick to your brush and it won't look very good when you start and then after it sets up for about an hour then it'll brush out a lot better and if you want to go back and forth and keep coming back to it and play with it that's fine if you're a guy who likes to you know spend about a week painting a, sculpting a pair of trousers then it's ideal you know but but for an impatient person like me I want to get it right the first time you so. must have been watching me <laughs> <laughs> so what I find and, and actually this is an idea that was suggested to me by uh, an Italian sculptor friend of mine Andre Iotti he's come to our show a few times uh, he, he actually told me that he'd start experimenting with this when he was here at one of our shows years ago and and he said he really recommended it. And I thought, you know, that's kind of like putting the chocolate and the peanut butter together, you know. <laughs> I never thought of that, but gee, it sure tastes great. Well, I haven't actually tasted what this, is, what this tastes like, but uh, mixing the two together it actually gives you the best of both worlds. I wouldn't mix them together to make fine detail, but mixed together, they enable you to really get... If you want to roll out the putty and use it in sheets for like separate free hanging pieces of clothing like you can see his coat. You can see the way the edges of his coat are hanging free. Can you see that? Those are separate pieces of putty the way his hat brim is separate. All of that stuff is fine grain but it's a mixture of the two and when it dries it's not going to have the slight flexibility, very slight fix of flexibility Duro will have on its own. It'll have a firmer uh, feel to it. It'll stay a lot sh hold a sharper edge, uh, but it still will have that finer grain that you see from the Duro. So it's it's a really nice combination. So so these are really this is really good for fine detail in small areas. This is really good for broad brush foundation stuff. This dries harder. This dries a little more supple. <coughs> Mixed together, they give you something in between. Simple as that. So it's 50 50. <laughs> With this, I always mix 50 50 religiously uh, because these, this actually, I don't know if it's still the case, but I know for years if I didn't mix these perfectly, when I took them out of the oven after 30 minutes, they had not set up. And if something doesn't dry in the oven in 30 minutes, and by oven, I'm talking about 170 degrees, it's just to speed up the curing time. It's not, it's not like baking at the kiln or anything like that. This is just accelerating the, the, uh, the, uh, curing time. The oven isn't necessary, it just speeds up the curing. You could, some people put them under a lamp, yep. you know, or put them in a little, a lot of people make like a little drying box where they'll, they'll take a little cardboard box and they put a lamp over the top of it. You can do whatever you want. I use, I use, my old faithful is, a, is the oven at 170 degrees, which is a, when I'm sculpting, it's a common fixture in our kitchen. You see the oven set to 150 degrees and the timer somewhere between 25 minutes and zero. It means there's a model in there, so. Every once in a while we forget and turn the broiler on, it's time for dinner. <laughs> Emily's laughing over there, that's happened. I baked a couple of them, I frazzled a couple of them over the years. Uh, oh, there's a model in there, I didn't know that, why didn't you do that? You should check first. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a little brief summary of the putties. Now having said that, uh, are these the only putties you can use for these? Of course not. There's so many putties out there. I'm one of these guys who believes that once you find something that works for you, uh, if it's working for you, keep using it. Uh, if, you, if you find something else that'll give you a better result, by all means, try it. Um, and uh, I've been using this for a long time. I know how to use it. I'm, co I'm comfortable using it. I'm, the older I get, the more, uh, as all of us are when we get older, I'm less likely to want to try something completely new. I tend to go to the things that I know will work and I know how to use them and all that, and that's the reason. Is that the right way? No, that's just, that's just the way I happen to do it. 